All right, 10 a.m. sharp. Is the sound audio quality good enough? Yeah, perfect. So actually, the first person that was using a microphone like this was in the 90s, was Madonna. So she pioneered that. So every time I'm now on stage talking with one of these, I feel like a little, like a, like a rock star. Um, my name is Jan Jungbaum. I'm here to talk about 17,000 contributions in 32 kilobytes of RAM, which is a very tiny amount, but I'll show you what we've done and how, we, how we've done that. Um, I work at ARM. Um, ARM is a company that is very little known outside of engineering world, and even inside the engineering world, it's not that well known. Um, our main job is that we design computer processor architectures. Um, so. What we do is we create reference designs, for example, for a new processor that might go into a mobile phone, like my iPhone, but also basically 95% of all the smartphones. And we create an ecosystem around that. So we design the reference implementation, we design the architecture, um, we design the tools around it, software tools, but then we leave it at that. And then we have other manufacturers, companies like NXP, Apple, um, uh, Samsung, that will actually take those designs and put it into silicon. So we are fabless, we don't have any factories ourselves. We work together with this really big community of other silicon partners that help us actually get these things on the market. Um, my job, which is kind of funny, like 10 years ago this was a job I don't think even existed, is that I run ARM's developer evangelism team. So we're a small group of people that care about how people are using our products and try to influence other developers to start developing on ARM. Um, that's kind of funny because that's also how I got into FOSS North. I think the best way of getting people to use your product is by showing them what they can build with it and showing the right ways of building with it. And open source is a really, really great vehicle for that. So it's, a, it's kind of the best way to educate the user by showing them what they can do with it and how they can do something with it. Um, that's like kind of a clear winner. So I've been doing open source for the last seven and a half years, um, full time. So I worked at Cloud9 IDE. Um, it's now part of Amazon Web Services. So we were building like the first open source cloud development, uh, development environments, really fun. After that, I moved to Telenor, which is typically not a company that people associate with open source. But um, Telenor is really active in uh, Southeast Asia. And about si uh, seven years ago, Mozilla started a new project, Firefox OS. We were saying we want to bring a very cheap smartphones to that part of the world, a part of the world where very little people have either access to the internet or access to smartphones. And we want to do that through devices that are have access to the open web rather than a closed ecosystem that other companies like Google with, with Android in part and their play services, and Apple is trying to do. So Telenor kind of liked that. I don't think they liked the open source aspect of it, but they really liked the not being dependent on Google and Apple part of it. Um, and they hired me and a couple of other people from Cloud9 to help them build that vision. Um, unfortunately, that didn't go anywhere. Um, for me, it's kind of funny. Firefox OS is still alive, um, but it lives on as a product called KaiOS these days. KaiOS is right now the the largest, the most used mobile operating system in India. Um, they sell about 50 million phones with KaiOS every quarter. So it's a huge success. These are on really cheap kind of feature slash smartphones. But it's built in this cool open source foundation, but it's not open source anymore. But it's kind of, it's, it's really weird. We, we spend all this time with hundreds of engineers trying to build this open source ecosystem. And then when Mozilla kind of gave up on it and the operators gave up on it, some other company said, okay, yeah, cool. Thanks for the work. We'll close source it and build like this really big business out of it. It's kind of ironic. Um, I mean, it's also open source, right? It's, it's not always like the outcome that you like, but on the other end, we have people now using the open web um, on all these smartphones. Um, so three and a half years ago, I moved to ARM um, in there. Um, like basically everything that my team does is open source because I can't really show people what they can do with our tech if it's sitting. Uh, this is something that marketing departments really like. If it's sitting behind like a paywall or like a, a place where you need to fill in your email address and your name for a white paper, that's stuff the developers don't like. So we, we try to do everything out in the open. 
Um, and how I see open source as well is that kind of it's like Stack Overflow, but then for bigger engineering problems. Stack Overflow, when that came out 10 years ago, for me that was a revelation. It was great. Like there's all these people that try to get like the common knowledge that we have as engineers accessible in a really easy way, really to the point. Like I'm looking for problem X. And someone will say, okay, wait, hey, have you tried Y or the, the solution is Z? And um, how I approach open source is that I think that with open source projects, we can do that on a bigger scale for like complete engineering projects. Not just, I need to know how I use feature X in language Y, but rather I have this big problem and no one has solved it before. And if I can solve it and I throw it on GitHub, maybe someone thinks it's useful. So what kind of striking, and it, this is a, a project that I wrote with the last commit uh, about four and a half years ago in November 2014 on mapping uh, data from cell towers to a location um, based on a project called Open Cell ID. And in those four and a half years, no one has ever opened an issue. No one has ever forked the project. Up until a few months ago, all of a sudden I get an email from this user is saying, hey, I'm using this in production and I'm running into this issue after I'm, after I'm using it <laughs> for multiple days. I'm like, shit, that is cool. And in that sense, not really the community building around the project, but you realize that this very narrow subset of a problem, like how do I map cell towers to a certain location, that there's other people that are also looking at that issue. And maybe they're not engaging with your project in that sense, but, they're but they encounter the same issue. They Googled for it or they searched for it and they found your project and they started actually using that. And I think it's even cooler, right? We have the uh, opportunity as engineers to share not just um, simple answers to engineering questions, but to share actually complete solutions for things. And that's, I think, what the power of open source is. Of course, for me, it's relatively easy to say that. I've been worked, I've been paid to work in open source for the last seven and a half years. But it's something that, even if I'm doing like non-paid work, it's something I really like to do. Like currently, about 250 repositories on GitHub. And I, I'd like to encourage, I mean, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, right? We're at an open source conference. We would like to think that if you do something useful, even, even when you don't think it's like directly useful for someone else or it's not like this big open source project that you're going to build this huge community around, if you solve this, this problem, it might be very narrow, very specific to what you're doing at this point. Just throw it up there. Four years down the line, someone might, run, someone might email you and say, hey, actually, I'm using this in production and it actually helps me solve a real business need. So that's kind of cool. Um, all right, so I think this is kind of an interesting graph on how the um, IT in general is growing. Um, during ARM's existence, it took us about 22 years to ship the first 50, mi uh, 50 billion processors. So basically from 91, when we, f when we launched, the very first product that had an ARM processor in it was the Apple Newton like the first uh, Apple wearable. Um, up until 2013, it took 50 billion chips. Then it took only four years to ship another 50 billion. And last year we shipped 25 billion. And we're expecting to do 100 billion in four years and up. So it's kind of when people ask me, like, when is this like big Cambrian explosion of, I of, of devices in general is going to happen? Like, fuck, it already happened. There's devices everywhere. And like, if we think about 25 billion processors, this is just the share that, that has ARM architecture in it. If you think, like, where are these going? These are not going in our traditional computers, but we thought about what computers were 20 years ago. Um, like, this was actually 20 years ago, the Barbie computer. It's like a, it's like a real thing. <laughs> uh, LGR Lazy Game Review has a really good review about this, this thing. Um, end of the 90s. Uh, nor in the BBC Micro, which is kind of one of the one of the founders or one of the founding members um, based on Acorn of ARM. Um, and not even in mobile phones. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of mobile phones. I think we're shipping a one and a half billion phones every year that are there, but it's nothing close to this 25 billion. If you look at where um, products are actually going, like in cars, for example, the Tesla Model S has 65 processors, ECUs, what they call it in automotive, 65 processors. Which is 
Uh, if I'm looking, I was I was in the market for a new toothbrush. So I was I was walking around London Stansted Airport. And it's really hard to find an electric toothbrush without Bluetooth these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. And also, um, uh, so consumer electronics is a really big market. Like I was just looking through my kitchen and like like counting on the electrical uh, electrical appliances that have some sort of processing power already in there. And then the industrial markets like these big robots. This is how most of our products are made these days. Um, I bought a piano the other day. So does anyone know what which one this is? Nord, indeed, yeah. So it's a Nord Piano uh, 3, really cool. So there's three distinct processors in the Nord. There's a distinct processor in the monitor and one in the other one. And even in the fucking foot pedal, there's a processor. It's weird, like I just bought six computers. <laughs> And I can play music on it. Um, so if we're, if we're looking at like computers are not computers anymore in the distinct self of what we thought about what computers were in the 90s, um, but rather uh, everything that we see, all the shipment and all the growth that we see is around microcontrollers. Think of it as, as like a one by one centimeter little blob that has everything in there. So it's a processor, RAM, and memory, everything that you need to run. Kind of the only thing you need to pair this with is an oscillator. That's that's it. Um, so these are small, about a square centimeter, I think. Um, they're cheap, about one or two dollars. They come with everything in silicon, uh, in one package, and really efficient if you don't do anything with them, which is kind of nice. I mean, no one wants to, uh, no one wants their devices to suck up all the energy in their house. Um, downsides, of course, is that once they're slow, like a hundred megahertz, maybe that's already kind of fast and very limited in, in memory, mostly RAM. So, but 256K of RAM is already quite a bit. Um, just to show you like, how small this is, this is a Nest. If you guys are familiar with that, like the round uh, thermostat thing, that's, the <laughs> that's a microcontroller. That's it, and this is like eight centimeters in height. Um, so they differ a little bit in application process, the one that you find in your computer. They're very similar in that same sense. I mean, it's still 32 bits, Mostly, like your computer's maybe 64 bits, but they're, they're normal computer processors. You still write normal programming languages with them. Um, the main difference is that they don't have a memory management unit. So um, if your Linux box or your Windows box starts up a new process, you don't get access to the direct access to the RAM. It creates a virtual memory space. And whenever you write like a certain bit in RAM, it will actually map that to physical memory. And it does like bounce checking there, so you can't write outside of your process. That's something we don't have on microcontrollers. Um, it also means there's no BIOS, there's no processes, there's kind of no security in that sense, no containerization. Um, the the big upside is that it's really fast to wake up. So uh, for us, we say if you want to wake up from sleep, it needs to be able to do it at 10 nanoseconds. And if you want to wake up from deep sleep, it's about 10 milliseconds. You know, try doing that on your computer. Um, so real-time AF, some access to general purpose input and output ports. This, this is not unique to microcontrollers because if you take, an, if you take a mobile phone and you look at like the, the volume buttons, typically the volume buttons are implemented as a physical keyboard. If you look at the Linux kernel for an Android phone with physical volume buttons, you'll see that's kind of like a, a keyboard with two columns and one row because, you know, the concept of a keyboard was already there in the Linux kernel, so why reinvent the wheel? And that's mapped to three GPIO pins. So you kind of have that already on, on phones or on application processors, but it's really broken out on a microcontroller. Typically you have 100 pins or something that you can use for all kinds of, of purposes to connect new sensors. Um. Oh. oh yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, once again on the size. So typically if you want to get started developing for a microcontroller, you do that through a development board. So. This is a this is a Nordic semiconductors NRF fifty one developed in Finland. Um, so it's uh, Norway, sorry, <laughs> I actually worked in the same building as them when I was in Telenor. So, uh, so it's about a centimeter uh, square, but it also has Bluetooth on board, which is kind of cool. Now, when people see this, they think, "Hey, that looks awfully familiar to another like small computer that I know for hobbyist purposes, which the Raspberry Pi." This is not a microcontroller. It might look like it a little bit because you have these GPIOs broken out and you have kind of everything in a single SOC, but this is a full-blown application processor. So if you start using 
this thing to monitor your temperature in your house, you're suddenly abusing a quad-core machine to get some data from a sensor. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of the difference, application processor, microcontroller. For me, I think if we're, if we're looking at like the projections that ARM is making, like the people higher up in the suits, they, they expect a trillion devices by 2030 to be on the market. It's an amazing amount. Like a really big part of this will be microcontrollers. So if you want to get into that, that right now is kind of the earliest you could start. Yesterday would be better, but today is the next big thing. Um, now, as I said, we don't have a BIOS, we have very limited RAM, and we don't have an MMU, so we, kind of, we can't really run a full-blown operating system as, as Linux on this. So within ARM, we started thinking, okay, if we want to build something similar to an operating system, but specifically for microcontrollers, like where should we start? Um, and we feel that like a lot of the software parts that we have on these devices are very similar between devices. So I need stuff like a file system. I need um, a flash driver that can actually handle um, that can handle power outages nicely. If you remember. Um, FAT, uh, the file system, uh, the file system, FAT, F-A-T, that, that is used in quite a bit of IoT devices, but it's not uh, power, power fill safe resilient at all. So if you just like jank it out while it's doing reading or writing, the chances that your uh, file system table is corrupt is very big. It's kind of shit on IoT devices or microcontrollers because there's no power down sequence. People just, whatever, the battery dies, okay. There we go, now my file system is corrupt. That's not great. So we need to do stuff. Um, typically these devices have like little flash chips where they write data, um, but they don't have a dedicated flash controller. So if you wanna use flash, flash is a limited set of arrays and write cycles. So if you wanna make sure that the thing lasts over 10 years, you need to spread out your writes over the, over the flash. But y you're not really gonna do that in software because that is really hard. You need to know like which blocks have I used before, which blocks am I going to use next. So an SSD has a uh, flash controller that does wear leveling, so it automatically spreads it out over um, over the physical structure of the flash. Um, but we don't really have that because it's way too expensive. So we want to do it in software, and that's something that you don't really going to you're not really going to write for your own project. But it's something that a lot of devices need. You need a networking stack because you want to connect your new smart meter to the internet. Um, Probably some crypto to make sure that your device can't be taken over easily. So all these like common parts. So within ARM we thought, there's already a ton of our devices out there. Um, they all share the same architecture, so it's relatively easy to write software in, a, in the same way for all of them. These are all things that are overlooked quite often if we look at the current IoT market, like specifically IoT, because security is a much bigger threat there, but also in wider microcontroller development. Isn't it an idea that we're just going to do that in the very same way as people have started building Linux as a like a collaborative effort? It's not Linus Torvalds who just sits behind his computer and like builds this. It's like all these companies together building this. So we wanted to do something similar and we started the project called Embed. So Embed is an open source, free and open source operating system for these type of microcontrollers. Make it easy to develop for microcontrollers in a safe way and have all these kind of basic things abstracted away for you. Just like you and Linux don't have to wait, don't need to know what actually happens if you call F open. Um, that's something that we want to do as well. So, so at the base we have a, a real-time operating system kernel because we really like the ability to use threads, this kind of thing. I mean, a microcontroller has, it's a single processor. How am I going to do threads? Do I want to implement a scheduler myself? Well, probably not. Um, it is a porting layer. We currently have over 170 different development boards ported to it from 20 different vendors or so. Um, some security, some connectivity. Um, like we have actual connectivity stacks, LoRa, LoRaWAN, Bluetooth Low Energy, Narrowband IoT, Wi-Fi, etc. Um, uh, and as a like completely open source community built. So the whole project is Apache 2 licensed. Um, we have a developer community, about 350,000 developers right now that are using it to build their own applications on top, but also contributing back to the operating system. So last year we landed 3,000 patches into the OS, 
from a wide variety of people. Um, we have companies working together with us to actually contribute. So, um, and what I'm kind of proud of is if you look at like the GitHub contributors to op to microcontroller or real-time operating systems, like the number of unique contributors, we have over 400, and um, the rest is actually all way below 300. I don't want to see this as like a competitor thing. I mean, we are actually working with the Zephyr guys in Lenaro, also an ARM project, but it's a couple of different ways of approaching the same problem. Um, but relatively successful. Like we do quite a bit of the contribu uh, of contributing, so about half, then a quarter is by our partners, so they maintain the board packages, um, and then a quarter is coming from the uh, um, open source community. And you kind of see this like big growth around 2016, because that's the moment that we said, okay, before we were only like a hardware abstraction layer, so there was one way of programming all these different development boards, but that was kind of it. And from 2016, we said, okay, we want to do more. We want to start getting to peripherals, we're going to start doing network drivers, um, and actually make it like a proper, kind of a bit more focus on the internet of things, uh, appliances, but still useful for other open so for other microcontroller development as well. So this is going pretty well. Um, we have a release schedule. Every three months we do a feature release, like a proper, proper release train that works, and then every two weeks we do patch releases. Um, the governance structure of the project is still a little bit with ARM. Um, so we don't have a proper technical committee and a marketing committee and that kind of stuff. Um, but we're currently developing that. So we will have a proper release, proper release train with... Um, also in a way where like people in the community can take a little bit more effort. Right now the only the big way of getting influence is, okay, please open a pull request. But we want to have a bit more of a committee style um, doing that. So we have a quite a large developer community. Um, most of them live at osdm.com. So this is, for example, the Q&A section. Um, what's kind of funny to me is that I was looking at, so these were like asked, I did a screenshot yesterday when I was sitting in one of the keynotes, and I saw like nine questions, and all of them had at least one answer already. I thought that's cool. And, and most of these questions are not even answered by ARM. They're answered by people either in the community or by our partners. If I have a problem with a certain SD board, then it's kind of cool that the people from SD are actually looking at it and they say, okay, yeah, maybe you're using this in a different way. Um, like not all microcontroller issues are easily abstracted. Um, if I set a ticker, I set something that needs to fire every second, then I need to drive like an underlying timer peripheral. But that is something that's implemented differently in every device. Or maybe I'm using a low power ticker. Or maybe I'm using an internal oscillator instead of the external oscillator. It like kind of differs what kind of behavior you have. So what we try to give like a single API is not always completely possible. So these are just some other questions also. Like here we have someone from ST from a vendor that is show that is telling like, hey, you have to you do this, or we have someone from the community that actually say, hey, you know, you can't do this with like the built-in libraries, but we have this other library that someone already wrote for you. Um, maybe try that, and then we have people from our own official um, community team that is actually replying to these comments. So for us, community building around this is we can do our part, both in writing the code and in you know answering any questions that people have. But for me, and that's you know that's why I like working with developers, is that everyone can just like go and get up and start opening a pull request against whatever we want to do, or go to forums and start helping someone. That is where you know, the actual power of, of open source kicks in as well. Um, we also need to make money, though. Um, like, we have a business unit currently with, I think, 500 people working on a variety of IoT things, and Embed is, like, one of these things. We still need to make money, so one of the things we do is uh, commercial support. Um, so we do long-term releases for uh, people that buy, community buy, uh, buy commercial support. So we say, okay, well, the 5.11 release will maintain that for you and backport security fixes, and we'll make sure that you have someone to call whenever you need to. Um, it's relatively expensive. I think a, our cheapest support package right now is $36,000 a year. But look at these. these The products that this goes into are products that ship in hundreds, th hundreds of thousands or millions of devices. So having someone to call whenever, you know... If you look at like the development cycle for embedded products or microcontroller products, you kind of start with kind of what do I need to do? 
is very waterfall, right? It's it's really hard to do like an agile method when you need to order 100,000 PCBs to go to a factory. Um, so you kind of start with like, what do I need to do? What, what are my requirements? Then you start kind of gathering like the hardware requirements that you need to have. After that, you start doing a little bit of like POC work. If at that point you realize, okay, something is amiss or I need to respin my board, that's relatively easy because you do low volumes. Uh, you probably do your manufacturing somewhere locally. When I was in Telenor, we had a we had a plant literally two two kilometers from our office. So whenever we wanted to do something, we just like drove over there, um, and then told them, okay, can we like change a little bit in like the board design? And they're like, yeah, fine. After that, you kind of freeze your components, both hardware and software. So at this point, you you're not going to do major changes in your design. You might say, okay, well, this flash chip was actually not great, but I'm going to use like a different variant of the same of the same chip. That's fine. Um, you're not going to say, okay, well, I'm going to upgrade my operating system version right now because that will trigger a complete redesign cycle of your of your product. Um, so then you do the you kind of do the finished hardware design. Um, then you do then you do software design. At that point, if you realize during your software design, okay, shit, now I need to change something in my hardware, it gets really expensive. So if you if you have someone that can actually help you backboard that kind of thing, that's actually worth it. A bit of, bit of a sidetrack. Um, so we do community engagement. Um, one of the things that we found out that really works is um, our office hour series. So every two weeks, we take one of the core engineers in the product. Um, in this case, uh, Bartek, um, he is our tech lead for all of Embed OS, and he designed our low power APIs. So we ask him then to come in. We have on YouTube, we have a live stream. It takes about an hour, 30 minutes of talking and 30 minutes of Q&A. Um, and we present whatever we're working on. And a really big part of that is the Q&A section, because this is for the community a way of talking with the people that actually build the product and see what their design choices are. So afterwards, also always the last 30 minutes are a Q&A, the, the questions roll, roll through as they are asked, um, and then we'll ask them on the stream. So it's kind of cool. I mean, if you look at like numbers, this one has about a thousand views. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a lot or not a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of you're building like something for embedded systems and you have 100 people in the room. Look at what I need to do right now to get 100 people in the room. I need to fly to Gothenburg and open my laptop and start talking here. Um, so doing this online is, is a lot easier to scale, although it's a lot easier to see if you guys are engaged with me if I'm looking you in the eye rather than if you're on the stream. But actually, through the Q and A, we get we get kind of cool. I think the the record number of questions we ever had was seventy five in one of these streams. Which is um, our documentation very similar to what we do with the operating system itself. Also lives on GitHub. Um, we don't hold. I mean, we show it on our own website also because we have like kind of like cool widgets like inline code fragments that you can then open directly in your browser. And like test it out on your on your actual development board, which you can't really do on GitHub. Um, so we have like a, a cross compilation step that takes it from here, versions it, and publishes it on our website. But everything lives on GitHub. Everyone wants to do something, they can do that. Um, a downside of building a product that's relatively complex. So we do a lot of commits. We have 170 development boards. Like, how do you keep it stable? Um, so we've invested quite a bit in continuous integration that we run on all our pull requests now. So this is how our this is how our um, CI test setup looked like about a year and a half ago. Just a bunch of boards that we that we put in a closet in our Austin office, um, and this is how it looks now. So we have proper racks. We currently have over 1,000 development boards under test, and every time a pull request comes in, we'll actually run our complete test suite on those. So we started. Um, we started. We have over a thousand, eleven hundred fifty functional tests. We have system tests. We have simulated tests, etc. And for every release, now we run about forty thousand hours of testing on real hardware. And that's kind of, it's cool. And the whole test suite is also like all the testing tools, everything that we use, that we um, build to facilitate. This is also open source. You can just, you can take a development board. You can run our uh, test setup, and then it will tell you exactly what passes and what fails. That's kind of cool, and that's kind of the only way to ensure that we actually have quality. Um, so, beside a community plan, the other way that we make money is that we use it as a, a facilitating tool. So, we have a product called Pelion, 
and Pelion does device management and data management and connectivity management for large amounts of um, IoT devices. So if a customer comes to us and say, hey, I want to build a million, of million IoT devices, your problem becomes a lot bigger than I have a device I want to connect to the internet. I have like a, a little temperature sensor in my house and I need to send some data. You need to start thinking about what is the identity of this device? Do I trust it? You need to start thinking about life cycle management. Like if this device is still running in two years, but I want to add some uh, functionality, is there a way for me to patch that functionality in the device? Um, what if I transfer ownership of my company to another company? How do I swap the certificates and devices out, etc.? For us, having a common operating system that we can use as the basis for those devices is really nice, and we build services on top of that. So it's kind of a hybrid, um, a hybrid approach where we can make some money of commercial support, but also of services built on top of open source. Um, yeah, so this is. <laughs> I don't expect anyone to actually like look over this slide. This is like all the blocks that we do. So there's a, if you look at like our what our community is doing, they do like high level stuff. Like for example, a library. If you have um, like an accelerometer, something that can measure, if you're like doing like cool moves with it, that is something that our community often builds. Uh, applications that is where our community builds. Then we provide all the blue parts. Our partners provide all the red parts. That's kind of like how everything fits together. Um, I'm going to actually skip over this for time. Um, yeah, so how, how we do our porting layer? It's kind of like, as the engineer in me, this is kind of like fascinating. Um, like, if you look at like how a peripheral works, like how we, how we want to design our API and how a peripheral actually works, it's completely different. Um, if, so this is how, uh, how an embedded OS application looks if you want to just blink an LED. It's very simple. You include uh, our library, then we say digital out, so we have an out port. Um, oh, I have sound on. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I was actually doing this on my kitchen floor, so <laughs> I'm happy I'm not actually talking through this. But you, s you say, well, I want to toggle that pin on and off, and then I wait, and then that's it. So if you're looking at like how that actually looks, is that there's not such a thing as a, as a pin known to the hardware. Um, so the hardware is sitting on a bus, and I can do stuff with that bus. And one of those pins might be on the bus, and I can either toggle that on or toggle it off. Now, um, how it actually works is that there's a memory space, 32-bit memory space, a 30-bit microcontroller. Um, and uh, those buses are mapped to certain memory addresses. So typically, in um, for a lot of the ARM microcontrollers, SRAM starts at 0x2 lots of zeros, um, up until, well, maybe so let's say 256k of RAM, something like that. Um, and then your peripherals are mapped to 0x4, lots of stuff. And then your other things like external RAM or um, external flash can be mapped even higher. But everything on your device has a memory address. So whenever I say I want to write a 1 to that LED, um, somewhere in our, in our uh, hardware abstraction layer, which is implemented by the vendor, someone has been saying, okay, well, um, the red LED is mapped to a bus, and that bus is memory mapped to address 0x4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Um And if you want to write a 1 to it, you bit shift that all the way to the left, and you write it to that address. And if you want to turn it off, you bit shift it the other way around, and you write it to a different address. So that's kind of, but that's re, that's that stuff that is completely uh, unique for the vendor. And that is something that we don't really want to do. So in our porting layer, we say, well, you need to give us a couple of primitives, like what is a general purpose input and output port, and what can I write to it? And then the vendor implements this kind of code. It says, OK, well, in this case, um, these pins are on this bus, and this is how you toggle it on and toggle it off. So that's they have a lot of freedom in that. Um, so we try to like abstract away over it. So we do stuff like thread synchronization and uh, and safety, etc., around it, and the vendor just tells us like what are the very unique features of your hardware. And it's also for vendors a way of um, it's kind of one of the issues that you that you see if you're building a product like this is that a vendor looks at it and they say, okay, well, I sell my board, but people write exactly the same code for it, and then they can also run it on a completely different board from a different vendor. Why would they pick me, except for price? 
Um, but these things are like wildly different. Like some vendors, they specialize in uh, in deep sleep mechanisms. Make sure that you your standby current is always the lowest. Some have more timer peripherals, like they have more hardware timers in there. So through this, we try to abstract differences away, but there's still unique features on certain boards that mi you might want to pick one way or another. Um, so yeah, low power, I think one of the cool things that we've done, which is often lacking in um, embedded products, especially if you look at like kind of the, the maker movement, is low power design. Um, because we, we kind of what we say is, well, we don't offer just like an operating, like a real-time operating system package, but we offer all these drivers and these networking layers, et cetera, on top of it. We can make like one thing that fits really well together. And one way where it shines is in our is in our low power modes. Um, so we can, if the board supports it, because you need to kind of a low power timer, you need a timer that can run without the MCU. Um, then you can actually go automatically in sleep. So this is, oh, that was not what I wanted. Um, so this is Blinky, like the same application that I showed just before. And this is if you don't have sleep features on your board. Um, average current will hover at about 43 milliamps, which is quite a lot. Like, let's say that you have a, a little LiPo battery, like the one that goes in your phone, has maybe 1500 milliamp hours. So it can, com so it can for one hour, it can do 1500 milliamps. So at 43 milliamps, we do times 30, you can run it for about 30 hours on a battery. Like, it's not exact science in that case, but about 30 hours. Um, however, if we then introduce a deep sleep APIs, and this is on a board that doesn't even support like super deep sleep, we actually can go down to about 300 nanoamps. So all of a sudden, our battery lifetime is goes from 30 hours to 3,000 hours on the same battery. And that's kind of cool. And the only way that we can do that is because we know exactly what what we ship with the OS, and we can make sure that everything like fits together nicely. Um, so we can even trigger that automatically. So if you take a board that supports it, you write your application, you hook up a, a power monitoring device, and you actually see that it probably goes into deep sleep. Um, skip over that. Um, so yeah, getting started. As said, we have 170 different development boards. Um, you can either kind of pick either one of them. This is a small subsection. There's actually way more, but at some point I just got tired of copy and pasting my screen. <laughs> so this is about 90 of them. Um, typically you want to do something with it, like a little computer that sits somewhere in your home that then just computes things is not very useful. Kind of what, what makes this fun for me is that you can attach new sensors to it um, and get some extra knowledge from the outside world. So you take a sensor, like, so as said, all the way at the beginning, use like a development board, because if I have a little chip, f centimeter by centimeter, and it's like a hundred pin package, then my pins are like this small. I can't solder that small. So, so a way of like doing that is say, well, we'll use a development board, and all these pins map to one of these pins on the development board itself. So it makes it easy. Let's say I use a moisture sensor, something that can like. Um, so the, the resistor value on the sensor changes depending on like, how wet the surrounding, um, the surrounding area is. So you can use this to put it in a plant, and then it will tell you how moist the plant is. Um, so you literally connect that as just a bunch of wires. Um, for this sensor, you have a signal wire, so it's an analog sensor because it's a resistor value. Um, you have power and you have ground. So you put a bunch of wires. Someone actually asked me, Jan, People always say like red for power and black for ground. Are these wires different? Like, no, the electrons don't flow in a different way depending on the color of the. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> so you connect those to like a pin on the board. So uh, um, we can use like an analog. Like so, not all pins are equal. So some pins can be used as like an analog input, some can only use as digital input, some support like really high frequency protocols like SPI, so you need to look at like your data sheet. Um, what we have here, this kind of the Arduino shield form factor, and those have all the pins that like the same, uh, in like the same location, so you always know that here there's analog pins. Um, so you connect those, and, and in this case, like these are the pins and that's it, and then um, from there, you can go to our online compiler. So typically, development for microcontrollers is really annoying because when I started doing this, 
the only tools that I could use were on Windows. Um, I had to like buy a paid debugger and I log into my VM and I started coding and it was all really annoying. Um, so kind of got fed up with that. So here we have like an online compiler. So you go there, you write some code in the browser, you click compile and then it downloads the binary file and you drag the binary file onto the uh, onto the dev board. It's kind of like a mesh storage device, USB mesh storage device, and then it will flash. We do that actually through another project that was open source. If you're interested in this kind of thing, we made an open source debugging probe called Daplink, and that allows us to do this mass storage device um, flashing and debugging, and also the UART over serial. Um, another way, if you want to start offline, we have Embed Studio released for Windows and Mac OS um, just the other week. So that allows you to do it on your offline environments, but we also integrate with traditional embedded IDEs like IR and, and Kyle and DK. Um, so then, yeah, we can start reading some data from the from the moisture sensor. Again, analog in. That tells me that abstracts everything away, like how these pins work underneath. I can read some value and I print it out somewhere or send it to a, to a certain location. Um, in the last five minutes, before we had q and I want to highlight a couple of other projects that we're doing. Um, so we run Embed Labs, which is kind of our, our scratch space for things that are interesting, um, but are not really production quality yet. However, this is all open source, so you can you can buy a dev board and get started with it. Um, it lives on labs.embed.com. It's a very, I know the URL is really hard, but that's it. Um, three of the things that I want to highlight. Uh, one is uh, Embed.js. Yes. Um, it's a project that I've been leading within ARM. Um, my controllers get more powerful every year. So like a typical microcontroller these days, one that you can buy for two bucks, has 256K of RAM and about 100 megahertz of processor speed. And that's actually something we could do a lot with. Um, so together with the JavaScript Foundation, together with Samsung and the Uni Intel and the University of SIGET, we worked on a JavaScript runtime that can run in these constraints. So that JavaScript runtime is called JerryScript. Um, it's completely ECMAScript 5.1 compatible, um, and it can run in about 64 kilobytes of RAM. So that allows you to give a kind of interpreted language running on these microcontrollers. So it consists of like a like a mapping layer from C++ to JavaScript, um, and then like an interactive shell, etc. So I don't see this as like the way of programming microcontrollers, but rather giving like scripting abilities to your customers. So we have a customer that is using um, that is building uh, like lockers that you use in train stations, but like the actual logic and like how much you need to pay and what like the the payment structure is and like when they need to lock again, that is stuff that they want their van they want their customers to be able to change. So they made kind of like a node red type of flow editor. They change the way they change the business logic, and then they push the compiled JavaScript to the device and they run that in the interpreter, which is kind of a really cool mix of two concepts coming together. Um the other thing is the embed simulator. So um I figured Back when I was doing stuff for Telenor, uh, we were using mscripten, which is an LLVM to uh, JavaScript or WebAssembly compiler, so that can take C++ and output some JavaScript or WebAssembly. And I figured, well, we have a really big code base, and that code base is C++. W why can't I run my embedded application in the browser? That would make it a lot faster. So we did that. Um, so the embed simulator takes all of embed OS with a custom like hardware section layer specifically for the browser, and then cross compiles that, and you can now run your application in the browser. So um, that looks like this. So you know, I can add stuff, and I can write my C++ here, change my pin. Um, yeah. okay, there we go. Really cool. So uh, and we even do stuff like networking layers, etc. So it's very fun. We used I. We were doing like an actual product, something that we needed to present at an alliance. Ninety percent of the code that we wrote was actually written in the simulator before we actually tested it somewhere else. So, kind of cool. Um, then the very last thing is, um, there's a lot of development right now uh, in getting neural networks to run on really small devices. So, you might have seen at the TensorFlow Summit, Google's uh, presented TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. That's a project that my team has been involved in. Um, and I think that is really cool, because devices that up until two years ago could only act as like Something that got data from a sensor and then send it off can now um, can now can now start running a neural network and actually doing conclusions on its own and only sending a conclusion over, which is kind of cool. So this is running on a 
on a $4 microcontroller from ST on a dev board. And we're running a neural network that can actually recognize digits that you write on the screen. So it's done with mic uh, microtensor. So you see the banana for scale on the left. So you press the button, and then the neural network runs. We train this on 60,000 images of handwritten digits, and then they'll tell you what actually happened. Um, and we can do that again with A's, I think. So for us, this is like one of the ways that we think that embedded development is going. Yeah. We, are, we can all of a sudden run um, interpreted languages on these. We can run neural networks on these. Um, and there's billions and billions and billions coming out of factories every month. So if there's ever a moment to get into this, that would be today. So to recap, um, for go to Q&A, I mean, most computers that we currently ship, they're not in your pocket. They're not on your desktop anymore. They're sitting everywhere. They're all around us. There's probably one in the Beamer and maybe one that actually controls the, the blinds here. Um, so for a long time, building, building software for these devices, and I've been there, was really painful. Everything had to be done in C or assembly. You could only do stuff on Windows. There was no communities around it. If you had any questions, you were on your own with like a big manual from your vendor. That's kind of it. Um, but that's no longer the case. Like we have communities around it. We have open source projects around it. We can do, you know, cool stuff like interpret languages or even machine learning on these devices. So if you want to get started with that, Ambo is the place to go. Find more information at os.ambo.com. <laughs> All right, thank you. I don't want to open it for Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have three minutes for Q&A, if there's any. It is very tight, the ARM architecture. Hmm? Oh, so the question is, how tight is Embed OS to uh, the ARM architecture? Um, it's very tight. So we, um, for Cortex-M architecture, we have a thing called CMSYS. And CMSYS is kind of the abstraction layer over the Cortex-M cores of all the vendors. And that is, we built on top of that. So if you want to run it on different architectures, you would have to port CMSYS first. So we, we don't support that at this point. Yes. Can I compile, all, yeah, uh, do I need to compile on a web browser or on Linux? No, so we have a cross-compilation tool chain called Embed CLI. You can use uh, GCC for ARM to compile your application through that. What crypto stack do we have? Uh, we uh, bought a company called Polar SSL a few years ago, uh, rebranded it and open sourced it completely as Embed TLS. And Embed TLS is, even on non-ARM architectures, I think is by far the widely most widely used um, TLS software TLS stack. And in addition, we do uh, hardware abstraction. So you can buy like a for microchip, they have a crypto accelerator, Aptek 608A, for example. And you can use that to do your crypto. Not anymore. All right, then I want to thank you all, and uh, let's break for some coffee and uh, be back in ten minutes. Thank you. Thank you.